Hello, and welcome to another episode of NASA Science Live. This is an opportunity for you to interact with NASA experts and have your questions answered in real time. I'm your host, Denise Hill, and we are taking you all the way to Australia, where there's a total solar eclipse happening right now. This event is unique and rare because it's both a total and annular eclipse, which is known as a hybrid eclipse. We're going to see real-time views, thanks to our friends at Time and Date. We're going to talk about the sun and answer some of your burning questions. You can send us questions using hashtag AskNASA on social media or drop them in the comment box wherever you're watching us from. The sun touches everything. It is Earth's life force. The sun-earth connection is a vital part of our lives and society. It influences a variety of systems on Earth, like agriculture, economics, climate change, politics, food and food scarcity, as well as the physical, mental, and emotional health of humans. We see its influence throughout our culture in art, music, religion, fashion and sports, and a host of other trends. During tonight's event, we're also going to share a special upcoming opportunity for you to participate in sun science. So let's jump right in. I'm joined today by NASA sun science scientist, Dr. Kelly Couric. Kelly, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Denise. It's my pleasure. So I think we should start off by first explaining the reason why we're here, the eclipse in Australia. So can you tell us how solar eclipses work and why this one is called a hybrid eclipse and what that even means? Definitely. Yeah, let's get started. So what a solar eclipse is, is it's an alignment and a dance between the moon, the earth and the sun. So the earth the, and the moon is in between uh, the earth and the sun and casts a shadow on the earth. Um, and that's a total solar eclipse when it completely blocks out uh, the uh, blocks out the sun, and that's because it's close to Earth. Um, and we go through the as the moon goes around. We don't have one every every month, but we do get them occasionally. We also have an annular eclipse, um, and an annular eclipse happens because the sun, the moon doesn't stay in a perfectly circular orbit. It, it sometimes is a little bit further away. So it doesn't completely black out the sun. So it leaves this ring of fire around the sun, like in the image that you're seeing here um, in that annular eclipse. And this eclipse in, uh, in Australia is a hybrid. So part of the path of totality is going to see totality. So you're going to completely black out the sun. Another part is going to see the actual ring of fire. And so that's why it's a hybrid. Based on the curvature of the earth and where you are on the path, you're either gonna see the total or you're going to see the annular eclipse. Okay, so eclipses are super cool events to see in the sky, but why do scientists care about eclipses and what can we learn about them during these events? Great question. So what happens during these events is that we can actually see with our own eyes, the sun's corona or hot outer atmosphere. And that's something that we, before uh, before the space age, we really couldn't do any other way. So we were able to study things that flow off of the sun, seeing this constant solar wind during these um, during these eclipses. We also did things like experiments in relative, general relativity um, and discovery, discovery of helium and other elements of the sun. So there's a lot of different things that you can do with eclipses. So speaking of sun science, is there anything happening in Australia right now? Actually, there is. Um, there is a kite experiment that is going on during this eclipse. So it's a new platform for us um, to actually take data from. Um, we've done things before in rockets or balloons or spacecraft, but this is now a kite. Um, and you're shown here as a picture. This kite is 21 feet across um, and it'll fly around 3,500 um, feet, and uh, it will actually take a, a spectrometer, so it'll split the light up, is the is the instrument aboard, as it looks um, at the sun, and try to find that flow that I was talking about, that constant solar wind, and how that escapes uh, the sun during this eclipse. And if it's successful, um, they'll hopefully fly it again in 2024 when the eclipse comes to North America. That's so cool. Who knew flying a kite could be both fun and educational? I love it. 
So I mentioned at the top of the show that there will be opportunities for people to participate in sun science. Can you tell us a little bit about the Heliophysics Big Year, what it is, and how folks watching can get involved? Definitely. The sun and all of us are uh, in for a big year. Um, starting in October of 2023 with the annular eclipse that goes across uh, the U.S. and then down into uh, uh, Central and South America. Um, then going to the uh, April 8th, 2024 total solar eclipse. Um, and then finally ending the long big year, um, December 2024, when Parker Solar Probe um, goes to the closest approach to the sun, 94% of the way uh, to the sun to study that outer atmosphere that we're going to see here in a few minutes with, uh, with this total eclipse. Um, and so this year is a way that uh, we can all belong in science and all belong uh, to learning about the sun and all the different ways that the sun touches our lives. And the term big year actually is a birding term, um, a citizen science birding term that is, that is studying as many species as possible of birds in one year. And what we're challenging folks to do is to study as many different things or relate to as many different things as they can about the sun. So can you see an annular eclipse? Can you see a total eclipse? What about aurora? What about seeing a solar flare go off? What about a participating in a sport or another event um, that relates you to the sun? And you mentioned citizen science, and citizen science is a big part of how folks can participate in the heliophysics big year. A few specifics come to mind, like uh, Eclipse Soundscape, Soundscapes is a citizen science project that allows you to participate in eclipse research by observing and collecting audio recordings during upcom upcoming solar eclipses. You then take the data and analyze it and determine how eclipses may affect the ecosystem. And to learn more about that one, um, you go to EclipseSoundscapes.org. Another one is, is called the Nationwide Eclipse Ballooning Project. And this one will engage teams from a range of colleges and universities in an adventure in scientific ballooning. These teams will participate in scientific ballooning during the upcoming annular and total solar eclipses in 2023 and 2024 across the eclipse path. Student teams will use innovative balloon systems to conduct experiments. To learn more about this project, go to go.nasa.gov slash N-E-B-P. All right, thank you, Kelly. We'll come back to you in just a moment to answer some of the questions we have coming in. Don't forget to submit your questions using hashtag AskNASA or pop them in the comment box on the platform that you're watching. So as Kelly just mentioned, there's a big year of sun science ahead of us. Mark your calendars, because on October 14th, 2023, there will be an annular eclipse where the moon only blocks the center part of the sun and creates what looks like a ring of fire. And then on April 8th, 2024, millions of people across the US will have the chance to see a total solar eclipse. Where will you be? NASA has some new maps that could help you decide. Let's take a look. so excited for these upcoming eclipses and truth be told i've never seen a total or an annular eclipse but for the annular eclipse coming up later this year i know exactly where i'm going to be i am going to be in albuquerque new mexico and i am so excited so to take a closer look at the nasa eclipse maps in more detail you can visit go.nasa.gov us eclipse maps let's chat 
with a NASA expert who is in Australia right now for tonight's solar eclipse. We are joined by planetary scientist, Dr. Henry Thru. Thank you so much for being with us, Henry. Hey, thanks for having me here. So you're in Australia right now. Can you tell me exactly where you are? So I am at Exmouth, Australia, which is in the uh, Ningaloo Peninsula in, the, in Western Australia. This is a really remote region of Australia. Uh, it's a long way from the closest city, Perth, closest large city, Perth, which is uh, itself a very remote uh, uh, capital city. So there are thousands of people down here who have made the trip, trip, trek all the way out to Exmouth, um, waiting for this, uh, for totality, which is uh, gonna be coming up here in, um, in a little more than an hour. A little less than an That's hour. so cool. That is so cool. It looks, it, I see a ton of equipment back there. Do you have anything with you and what are you gonna be doing? So I have a solar uh, uh, telescope here myself. I'm gonna be watching the sun as it, uh, as it disappears in, uh, in H alpha, uh, which is the, the, uh, the wavelength where you see a lot of the activity of the sun. You see a lot of these uh, uh, features on the sun, uh, both on the disc itself and off to the, off to the side. There are thousands of people here with their own telescopes uh, recording the sun, taking pictures of it in various ways. But most of the people here are not scientists. They are fans of the sun and, uh, and are here for the excitement of, of being here at the eclipse. Um, uh, there are there are uh, thousands of people who've been coming in all morning. Let me just give you a little tour of the of the uh, of the site here. Uh, you can see um, going here. We are right next to the right next to the ocean here. A uh, great place for seeing whale That's sharks. So We're not going to see those cool. things. Everyone here is looking at the looking at the eclipse instead. And you can see all the uh, thousands of people behind us there. That is awesome. I am so jealous right now. That looks so awesome. Okay, we're going to let you go so you can go enjoy the eclipse and uh, see it firsthand. Thank you so much for joining us. So here's a question. Since the moon orbits around Earth roughly once per month, how come we don't have 12 solar eclipses every year? So glad you asked. Here's why. So many of you watching have questions about the sun and about eclipses. So let's get to some of those now. Remember, if you have questions, you can send them to us on social media using the hashtag AskNASA, or just drop them in the comment box from wherever you're watching us from. So now I'm back with sun expert, Dr. Kelly Couric, and we're about 30 minutes away from totality. As a reminder, you are seeing real time views of the eclipse in Australia. Thanks to our friends at time and date. Kelly, Let's tackle some of these questions that are coming in online. But first, I want to jump the line and ask a question myself. I am curious about how do you watch an annular eclipse and a solar eclipse safely? That's a great question because really safety is our number one priority here. So for the annular eclipse, you will always have to use a pair of uh, solar viewing glasses. These are not sunglasses. There are specific glasses um, that are made to a certain standard so that you can look at the sun through the annular eclipse. Or you could make an a indirect viewing device, which means that your back is to the sun and that device is in front of you, whether that's a strainer, like a kitchen strainer, um, or even your hands. You can make um, a strainer this way um, and project the image of the crescent moon um, on uh, or the ring of fire onto uh, onto a wall or a floor, things, things like that. Um, for the total solar eclipse, Whenever the sun is only partially eclipsed, you must again have those glasses, the safe eclipse glasses, not sunglasses to watch um, or the indirect viewing method. 
And during totality, we want you to be able to look directly at that corona, um, directly at that sun's corona, the beautiful atmosphere um, that we study and that really flows out towards us and connects us to the sun. So that's how you safely view an annular and a total solar eclipse. Okay, so I think I got it. So for an annular eclipse, Eclipse glasses the entire time or indirect viewing method the entire time. And for a total solar eclipse, glasses, indirect viewing until totality, and then back to glasses, indirect viewing. Exactly. Got it. You got it. All right. Um, our first question from viewers online from is from Mitsuhari Ida. And if I said that, if I mispronounced that, please forgive me. On Twitter, she's asking, why are some eclipses longer than others? That's a really good question. And it does have to do with how they line up. In the video that we saw just a little while ago, um, to get the eclipse, you have to have the moon and the sun and the earth in that direct straight line. Um, and so sometimes it's just a little bit uh, off in one direction. So you get some of the shadow, but not a lot. And based again, um, where that position actually is, is how long you get the eclipse. So about the longest we could ever get theoretically is around seven minutes, uh, seven minutes of eclipse. Oh, wow. We're only going to get around a minute today um, in Australia, but we're very lucky to get about four and a half minutes um, next year in 2024 wow. for the total eclipse. Excellent. So I'm um, looking at what we're seeing now. Can you tell us what it is we're seeing, what we're looking at? Yeah, so right now what we have, what we're looking at is the uh, yellow or the white ball is the sun. And we have the uh, black crescent on the bottom is actually the moon's shadow um, going across or the moon's disk that you see blocking out the sun. Um, so we've already made what is called first contact. So when the first looks like there's a little bite taken out of the sun by the moon um, and we're moving through towards um, what will become uh, the second contact, which meaning that that disk of the moon will, will touch the other side of the disk of the sun. Wow, that's amazing. It's absolutely beautiful. All right, so let's head back to questions online. Prince Z on YouTube asks, how many times does this happen and how long does it last? And what impact does it have on our planet? So let's take that one at a time. How many times do total eclipses happen? So there are uh, there is a solar eclipse about every 18 months um, somewhere on the earth, but there is, the earth is large and there's a lot of bodies of water. So sometimes it's over water and not land. Um, so it's, it's relatively, um, relatively common, you know, every year and a half, um, but in one place, it averages around 375 to 400 years to get one in wow. a specific place. So it's, it's special to have it in your place. Um, and you could probably find one if you flew somewhere in the, in the world every 18 months. Okay. And um, how long, you kind of answered this, um, how long they last. And um, if you want to elaborate on that, talking about like the different time frames that you mentioned before. Yeah, definitely. So they can last um, anywhere from a few, a few seconds or a minute uh, to actually, you know, up to seven um, is the seven minutes would be the longest one, but that one's not going to happen for, qu for quite a long time. Um, so really, uh, about four minutes is what we four and a half to minutes we're going to see um, along the path in um, in 2024. And is there any impact of eclipses on the planet? on earth definitely so we're and we actually use them as a as a scientific study um both here and um and elsewhere so when you're experiencing a total solar eclipse and this is one of the things that as beautiful as this image is it can't quite capture is it's a full body experience um so it becomes cooler so there's a temperature change um it also gets darker so animals um that normally go to sleep at night go to sleep because they think it's they think it's nighttime um, and then they wake up after the sun comes back up so a rooster would crow or crickets would chirp and stop chirping and and um, all of these things so um, it does have an effect on the earth and we're actually using it also um, in 2023 and 2024 to study the ionosphere or layer of the atmosphere um, where we actually use for a lot of communications um, and how that you know day night instant day night shift we're actually using it as a way to study that effect on earth 
That's awesome. That's amazing that uh, it does have this impact and that animals and nature responds. I think that is so cool. Um, okay, so next question. Tunisia T Tucker on YouTube asks, these really seem rare. So when is the next hybrid eclipse? Ooh, that's a good question. I actually don't know when the next hybrid eclipse is. I'm going to have to look that up and we'll have to we'll have to find that and put that on the NASA website. Do you know how rare they are? Uh, they do tend to be uh, tend to be a little bit more rare than uh, than the total or uh, annular eclipse, because uh, I think they have to happen at a, just a certain kind of geographic location. So they're, they're a little more rare than uh, than the total or the, the annular. Carolyn Craig has a great question that I also have. So like what equipment do we use to determine when an eclipse like this is going to happen and how far in advance are these predictions um, made? How far in advance can we make, can we predict when an eclipse is going to happen? That's a great question. And because we understand um, the orbital dynamics of the moon and the sun and the earth, um, we can actually predict them out very far. Um, there are maps of, you know, hundreds of years, if not thousands of years of data, because you can project where the, where the sun, the earth and the moon will be. Um, and so we rely on that predictability and actually in millions of years from now, um, the moon will be moving, moving away so that it will not be able to actually do the, do eclipses anymore, but that's really a long time away <laughs> um, wow. but eventually the moon will not be able to cover yeah that is still yeah, so we fascinating a long, way, long time oh wow that's really cool um mickey manoya on youtube asks um a question you kind of already answered but i'd love for you to elaborate on it it's about like nature and it's like will the birds go silent and do we know why like what do they think is happening since it's only for a short amount of time Right. So it, um, it's for a short amount of time, um, but you kind of have a, a somewhat normal lead in um, to nighttime. So when you're um, when you're experiencing a normal nighttime, the sky gradually gets dimmer. Um, you know, you start to see with a sunset, maybe a pink or orange or beautiful colors. Um, and so, you know, you know how to kind of get ready for bed um, or get ready for it to be nighttime. Um, and so it's not, um, you know, it's the light is eerie, actually, as um, as you go into the solar eclipse. It's not quite the sunset, um, but it has some characteristics of the sunset. Um, so I'm not an animal expert, um, but I would guess I would guess that they would just sense that it is the same um, the same kind of characteristics of nighttime. So okay, let's get ready for bed, and then suddenly the sun comes back up, and they're like, "Well, yes, that was the shortest nap ever." <laughs> I love that analogy. That is amazing. That, and it makes sense. Um, Kevin Boknight on Twitter asks, um, does it go completely dark during totality? It gets very, very dark. And like I said, that the um, the light is very eerie. Um, when I saw my first eclipse, total eclipse in um, uh, South Carolina, it was definitely that like gray, dark, uh, dark around the eclipse. And then there was this eerie all around the horizon, uh, like orangey light, uh, much like a, a sunsetty type uh, colors. Um, so it was very eerie light and it, it is significantly dark. Oh, that's excellent. I'm so looking forward to it. It just sounds so artistic and creative and amazing. Um, oh, this is a good one. So Mike Mech on Facebook is asking for, um, for us to go in a little bit more detail on actual uh, safety and eye safety on the glasses during the eclipses. Great. So like when you were talking about, so thinking about like in Australia, they're having both a hybrid and uh, a total eclipse. Uh, so annular and total. So can you talk about the differences and go through that again. Right. So where our friend Henry was, um, they will have a total solar eclipse. Um, so right now it's partial. The, the view that you're, you're seeing from time and date um, is a partial eclipse. And um, so at that point in time, you must have your safety glasses on, your eclipse glasses must be on, or again, indirect viewing method, one of those two things. So Henry right now should only be looking at this through, through safety glasses. Um, and then once it becomes total, 
he'll take them he can take them off and be able to look at uh, look at the sun and look at the corona and see what it's doing i'm very interested to see to see what we're going to see um and uh then uh once he knows uh, that it's going to the sun is uh, the moon is moving back and you're going to see more sunlight um that's when you have to put your glasses back on for the total um now if you were to go uh kind of a little bit further along the path of this eclipse that is where you're going to see the annular eclipse so they're actually not going to get an annular and a total in the same place so get a total in this place but then further along the path it will become annular because the curvature of the earth is then making the moon just that slight farther away so it just again doesn't block out the whole entire sun um so that and that they must those people who are further along the past path of this eclipse who are getting the annular must keep their glasses on the entire time so they will not be able to see the corona themselves uh, okay excellent thank you for clarifying um, Adam F. on Twitter asks, how wide is the path of a solar, of a total solar eclipse in general, would you say? Right. Um, in general, uh, it could be normally around a couple hundred miles or a hundred miles. Um, so I think it's 150 uh, in 2024. Um, uh, and uh, so, yeah, so it's about that wide. It's not super wide, um, but it's, it's a good distance. Um, okay, next one. Sunwit Ghosh on YouTube asks, so this is a hybrid eclipse from Australia. So in Australia, it's a total eclipse. Where's the annular eclipse taking place? Do you know? Do you uh, happen to know? It is, uh, I think, uh, Papua New Guinea, like as you go uh, up up the path uh, of Totale. So um I don't have the I don't have a visual of the of the path right now, <laughs> but uh, but yes, as you as you would go further up the path, you would see something again much more uh, like you see on the right to the annular eclipse, that ring of fire. Okay, so, and this is a really good question. So, uh, Bray Kimberly on YouTube is asking: Are there special cameras or lenses made for cameras to record solar eclipses? There are, and this is another um, thing that we have to worry about with safety, or at least think about, plan about for safety. Um, and so um, we don't want to just use our glasses um, with this. So there are special filters for telescopes, um, binoculars, uh, cameras uh, that you can get, you can research and find um, appropriate um, appropriate stuff filters to put in front of those um, at the entrance of the sun. So we don't want to use our glasses in this case. Um, we want to use uh, we want to use specific things designed for telescopes, phones, or um, or binoculars. Excellent. Okay, Mohammed Elma on YouTube asks um, a question about the geometry of eclipses. So why is the sun and the moon, from our perspective, exactly the same size? That's great. And it's a matter of distance and size. So the moon is the right distance away and the right size because the sun is bigger, but it's so far away. So it's 93 million miles away versus the moon being much closer. Um, so it's the same that I've been explaining it as um, the fact that when you put your hand right up in front of your face like this, you can black out almost ever and see everything. So the moon's just that close, where if you put it further away, you can see you know, around it and everything. So it's just the fact that the moon happens to be the right, right size and shape and then very close. And so that's why it's able to, um, able to black out the whole huge sun. Ah, it's all a matter of perspective, I hear you saying. <laughs> yeah. All exactly. right. Adriana <laughs> um, on YouTube asks, um, why is the annular eclipse called a ring of fire? And then she also sends us love from Arizona and says, we rock. <laughs> Yay. I love Arizona too. Um, and uh, so why they call it a ring of fire is that it looks like there is that orangey um, ring of fire um, around the around the moon as as this image sh shows. Um, it looks like kind of a, something's on fire um, in a ring. So that's why it's called the ring of fire uh, eclipse when it's an annular eclipse. Right. So there's the sun is not actually on fire. There's no actual fire. It's just describing what it looks like is what you're saying. <laughs> exactly. The, the sun. Yes, the sun is safe. <laughs> Excellent. 
SimCity on YouTube asks, if the moon moves on a horizontal plane, why are we watching the moon rise from the bottom up? So does the moon move on a horizontal plane? Right. Okay. So the, this, the moon is um, inclined. So if the earth's road, if the earth goes on this plane, it's inclined, the moon is inclined. Um, there we go. <laughs> There's the graphics. Look at there. Um, is in, is inclined um, as shown in this graphic. So it doesn't always hit um, the shadows. Doesn't always hit the Earth, and that's again why we don't have twelve eclipses um, every year um, because it's slightly off. And due to that geometry, that's why uh, that's why it doesn't it doesn't do. So it's not in a necessarily a horizontal plane, um, and uh, and that's again why we don't get eclipses every month. All right, Chrissy Astromilli on Twitter asks, what observations are being done from space of the eclipse? And then anything from the other side of the moon or the moon shadow that you know of? Oh, cool. All right, great. Um, so for the uh, assets that we have in space that are watching uh, the sun, um, they aren't necessarily in the path of the um, of this eclipse, right? They don't necessarily uh, live right over Australia. Uh, per se. Um, but we do make instruments that simulate an eclipse. So things called coronagraphs. So we basically make a false moon that kind of looks like a thumb that goes up in front of the camera and blocks out the center of the sun so that then we can go and see um, the uh, corona that's coming off of it. Um, so we do make space-based eclipse observations, but they're not the natural eclipse observations. They end up being, um, they end up being manufactured. We do sometimes um, in uh, certain telescopes like Hanode, um, and I think SDO as well, um, Solar Dynamics Observatory, um, are able to get eclipses in their orbit as well, but they don't normally coincide with the ones that uh, that we're talking about here. Uh, they Because they're on a different orbit, they have a different um, trajectory that, that line up the spacecraft and the moon and the sun. Excellent. Um, our team behind the scenes got us an answer to the question about why today's annular eclipse is visible. So, or where today, I'm sorry, where today's total polar eclipse is visible. So the total eclipse is visible, visible in Australia and Southeast Asia. The annular eclipse is visible um, over the Pacific and Indian Oceans. And a partial eclipse is visible from Australia, Southeast Asia, and... Antarctica. So there's that. Thank you behind the scenes team. Love it. Um, Rebecca Gergens says she is watching the live solar eclipse with her class in Macau. And if it is daytime in Australia, why does the telescope feed look like it's nighttime? So why is it all dark? Why is it black? Well, yeah, that's interesting. So they are looking, um, I think it has to do with the filter of the telescope. Um, they're filtering out the light so that they can, uh, I think this is the H alpha feed, um, which really focuses on a specific part of the light. Um, so you get that heat from the sun because um, I'm starting to see a prominence appear um, in the lower uh, left hand corner. So um, just past there, their little thing that's kind of shooting out um, the uh, prominence there. Um, that uh, that kind of indicates that that's the l wavelength or, or the type of warmth of light that we're looking at. Um, and uh, so that's why it probably looks dark because nothing else out there is that warm. Um, but yes, it is uh, it is daytime in Australia. Um, so uh, but as they're as the sun's covering up um, more and more, it will at least um, in Exmouth will uh, will become darker and darker and again experience a, a false night for about a, a, a minute. Excellent. How you doing? Are we killing you with the questions? They are coming. They are, well, these great. are great. These are great questions. <laughs> yeah. All right. I have a really good one from Angel Shinari. She asks, next year, totality will be in Mexico. So I'm assuming it's a total solar eclipse. And she's wondering if you know how long will totality last then? Any ideas on that one? 
So uh, it's around four and a half minutes, um, and there are great resources online that you can find um, your city and state and uh, find the exact timing for that location. And that's actually another important part of planning your eclipse viewing is to go to those trusted um, sites and find the list of the times um, that both the length of totality so that you can enjoy that corona and soak up all of that beautiful uh, solar wind and that uh, and all the, the magnetic fields that are moving things around um, and that you'll be safe, that you'll be able to know when you need to put your glasses on um, and to plan to make sure to be there well ahead of time so that you don't miss it. And will NASA have um, resources that kind of help people uh, find places and times and that kind of information? Definitely, there are uh, there are some resources um, that will help with uh, things like the map. Um, we'll show you where uh, where there is the path along the path of totality and what uh, cities and and states will experience totality. And actually, the entire contiguous U.S will um, have a partial eclipse that day. Um, so even if you're not um, part of the uh, line that goes from uh, Mexico to Texas, um, up through uh, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, Vermont, uh, New Hampshire, and out through Maine and then Nova Scotia, <laughs> um, and Canada, all of those, all of those places, um, you'll get a total solar eclipse, but the entire continental United States will get um, some type of uh, partial partial eclipse as well. Um, and then the other the other side of that uh, on the left hand side is the annular eclipse that will happen in 23. That, that is so cool. And it kind of brings us back to like the heliophysics big year, like the sun touches everything. And in the US, like that is such a unifying and just a beautiful moment when everybody will get at least some portion of an eclipse. That's really cool. Um, before we pop to the next question, we want to thank Time and Date uh, for this amazing um, feed that we're watching. And we're watching it live. We're watching the magic happen live. I'm so excited. Um, let's go to a next one. Uh, Mortz730 on Twitter asks, what changes the duration of totality? So what makes it different? Right. Um, I get it. It's all about geometry. So it's all about where your place in space. Um, we all belong here and the place in space does matter. Um, so uh, depending on exactly in the orbit of the Earth and the sun and the moon and how they line up um, is how long you will uh, get totality for. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, how it lines up, uh, and because it's it's at a place where the the moon shadow is moving very quickly, um, it only lasts for around a minute. Um, when you're closer to the equators, it takes a little longer to move across that land, so um, so it goes a little bit um, a little bit slower. Um, you can get a little bit longer uh, longer durations, um, and then again, it's all about that that lineup between the Earth, the Moon in the center, and the Sun. Um, and so as it goes around, it will, uh, it will create, you know, different, different lengths of time in the eclipse. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, that's a great explanation. Um, Nat A on YouTube asks um, about eye safety. So what happens or what could potentially happen if we look directly at an eclipse or look directly at us at the sun? Right. So looking at directly at the sun, which you should never do, um, would cause the back of your eye to burn in uh, the image of the sun. Um, and so you would have a blind spot in the uh, area where you had viewed the sun. Um, so it is not advised <laughs> to do this. Um, so make sure that you have your safety glasses or an indirect viewing method um, if you don't have safety glasses um, in order to make sure that you can safely do this and safely safely see afterwards. Yes. So the takeaway is be safe. Got it. Got it. Love that. Um, the plastic effect on YouTube asks a really good question. Um, so are lunar eclipses or solar eclipses more common? Is one more common than the other? Oh, that's a good question. Wow, I have never thought of that. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> I was like, oh, you just put that on me. Um, because I, you know, uh, uh, so, you know, a lunar eclipse happens when the Earth is blocking the sun from uh, the from the moon. And so that is why you're getting that, you're getting that darkness or that eclipse. 
Um, is it more common? I think it is, but I, my brain is not, is not functioning. Maybe we need some behind the scenes, <laughs> some behind the scenes, yeah. phone a friend, phone a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. We're the plastic effect, you may have stopped a NASA scientist. <laughs> um, and I that just goes to show you, like, we don't know everything. I think it's, I, these are great questions. We have Kelly on the spot. She doesn't have any of these answers. She's answering the best. You're doing an amazing job, my friend. <laughs> I mean, really, that's what a scientist is. It's, it's, a, it's about, you know, figuring, figuring out how to do it and finding the right source of information, right? Um, so it's not necessary that I know every fact and every everything about, you know, the sun. It's about I know how to um, examine the information and say, oh, hey, like this person might know it better. Or, um, and then is that reasonable, right? If they suddenly told me like, well, the moon's made out of, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, mm, no, that's not right. <laughs> um, I have to know, need to know, you know, approximately what it is. Um, but again, you know, not, no, I don't necessarily know everything. Yeah. And we specialize, right? Like sci as a scientist, you, you're specializing in heliophysics. And then we have people that specialize in planetary science or lunar science. And so it makes sense. I'm just messing with you. I'm just joshing with you. Okay. All right. Scott is asking, why does the moon change locations on screen when we see different time and dates telescope feeds? Um, I think that that is uh, just a uh, orientation of the telescopes um, yeah. because yeah, I, it might drift to like one side of the feed, one side of the picture or the other. Um, and that's just alignment of the telescope. Um, it is, uh, it is, it takes a lot of setup to learn how to do this type of imagery as well. They're doing amazing at time and date um, and they have done amazing for forever. Um, so, but it takes a lot to get it to look this good. Um, so uh, that's actually why I, I tell people your first eclipse, let, let the experts do it and just experience it um, because you can, it's a great hobby to figure out how to, you know, how to do this or, or you know, and how to, line up the telescopes and do that, but it's a lot of work. And so maybe the first one, just experience it. Yeah. Yeah. I am looking forward to my first one. No cameras, no anything. It's just going to be me and watching nature do its thing. I love it. Um, okay. We have another kind of moon question for you. <laughs> Aaron Equus on Twitch asks, so there's a lot of talk about the sun during the solar eclipse, of course. Are there any unique properties of the moon that are only visible during an eclipse that you know of? That's a that's a good question. Um, the moon is uh, is rocky and not quite as smooth smooth and kind of you know it looks like a beautiful ball when it's full um, from the Earth, uh, but it actually has craters and valleys, so peaks and valleys, and you can see some of those. And that's actually um, what we'll see coming up here uh, with the Bailey's beads um, is actually the last bits of the fact that it's not perfectly smooth. Um, we're seeing little bits of sunlight still kind of escape until it completely covers the face of the sun. So as you're seeing in the um, in the feed right or in the um, image right now, is you'll see those little beads, and those are actually telling us about the peaks and valleys on the moon. Excellent. Okay, so we have a really good question from um, Heather Jarvis. Um, and the question is, is it happening or almost over? And what time is totality? So what are we um, seeing so here? It is it is happening. Um, so we have most of the uh, most of the disc covered right now. Um, and so the upper left um, is the moon that dark uh, circle or semicircle um, is cutting out the little crescent sun that we're seeing. Um, and the prominence is still there on the on the left hand side. Um, and so what is what is happening and we're, I think we're around uh, 10 minutes, I think from you no know, 15 minutes from um, totality. Um, and uh, so then we'll see those Bailey beads that we just talked about. Uh, diamond ring is the last one that that comes out because it looks like there's a great big diamond on the uh, on the sun. Um, and then that'll go off and then we will see totality. And uh, that's that's where we would take off our eclipse glasses if we were there and uh, kind of bask in the seeing the corona and, and uh, experiencing the whole thing. And then um, 
after that minute's over, we would put on our glasses and we will then go backwards and see the diamond ring, the Bailey's beads, and then um, back to this partial eclipse. So you kind of talked about this before, but Kaz on YouTube is asking, is it possible to never have an eclipse during a year? Um, since they happen about every 18 months, it would be possible to uh, not have one during a year. Yeah. Um, and I'm assuming that just meant solar eclipses, um, yes. that Kaz was asking about. All right. Mm -hmm. Very Pezzy on YouTube asks, is it possible to see the eclipse using a telescope from home? That's a good question. Um, so really there is, you need to be in the path of totality. Um, or a path of partial or the path of the eclipse in general. Um, so either a partial eclipse or a, uh, or a total eclipse. So it somewhat depends on on where you live. Um, again, if you're in the uh, U.S., um, you will see one in 2024 um, or 2023. So um, hopefully, yes. And then if somewhere else, we can uh, find resources online uh, to see when the next eclipse eclipse is going to be in your area. Excellent. Oh. Our folks working in the background, you guys are geniuses. So for the question asking if lunar or solar eclipses are more common, we have a little bit more information for you. Lunar eclipses and solar eclipses are about equally common. They usually happen in pairs. So a lunar eclipse will usually happen two weeks before or two weeks after a solar eclipse. However, more of the Earth will be able to see a total lunar eclipse than a total solar eclipse. So they may seem more may seem more common in one given location. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, yeah, that's great because I think that that's what I was thinking. Is it's more common to be like, oh yeah, you can see a lunar eclipse than a solar eclipse is a much more narrow path because the moon's the moon's smaller. Yes. Okay. Great. Excellent. Uh, yeah, that was thanks. a really good answer. Thanks for the clarity on that. Yeah. Um, Willie D on YouTube asks, what kind of gravitational pull does this kind of event do to the life on Earth with, celest with celestial body alignments? Are there animals and plants that react to this event? Thanks. Well, that's great. So um, animals and plants do um, respond to this event in general. Um, again, from what I understand is much more from the actual um, visual or um, sensory of the darkness um, that they sense um, rather than maybe direct gravitational pull. But maybe that's a, a study that you should propose that uh, what's the what's the effect um, on on animals uh, for gravity? I think it's my, you know, my sense is that it's it's more from a visual sense than a than a gravitational sense that there's an effect on animals. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Susan Stalker asks, do solar flares interfere with technology here on Earth? And is there cause for concern? That's a really good one. That's a really good question. Um, and uh, yes, solar flares do potentially cause issues uh, with our technology here on Earth um, and all of our space assets. Um, and so we are, um, we uh, at NASA, as well as in partnership with, with many different folks in commercial, as well as all uh, within the government, NOAA, NASA, NSF, all of the, all of the folks um, are working on this. Um, it's a term called space weather. Um, it's the effect that the sun has on uh, the Earth and and uh, the the entire environment, the entire interplanetary environment. Um, so we are looking to mitigate those things, um, things like potential power outages or um, inducing uh, geo uh, huge currents in the Earth, things like that. Um, we are looking into that and uh, and making sure that those solar flares don't uh, don't get the best of our technology. Yeah, and that's a big part of the heliophysics big year, right? So like. At NASA, the heliophysics um, has a fleet of missions that are working to study um, the phenomena of space weather and the sun's impact you know, throughout our universe. Um, particularly, do you wanna talk a little bit about Parker Solar Probe, which has touched the sun? <laughs> yes, yeah, so Parker Solar Probe, um, a little near and dear to my heart, um, is the <laughs> spacecraft that has uh, gone in and actually touched uh, this corona uh, that we have seen. Um, and it is a spacecraft that uh, goes in and uh, 
looks at the particles coming off of the off of the uh, sun, both through uh, imaging as well as uh, scooping some up in some of the detectors um, and studying the magnetic fields of the sun. So um, that mission has uh, successfully touched that corona and is uh, continuing to study it and to, again, help us understand that space weather. Excellent. Yeah. Um, looking at this, we're getting closer. We're getting closer. I'm so yes. excited. It's happening. It's happening. I know. It looks like a great big smile. <laughs> it's a great big smile right now. The sun's kind of smiling. <laughs> Um, okay, back to the question. So we have two related questions. David Gray on YouTube asks, what is the expected temperature drop during a total solar eclipse? And Raymond DeMay on YouTube is asking, is there a measurable temperature drop? So are, are people going to be able to feel a difference? You can definitely feel a difference. It can be a couple of degrees to tens of degrees. So like, um, I, for instance, my last solar eclipse, I had to put on a down jacket. I was in a short sleeved polo and had to put on a, a down jacket. Um, I'm also cold, so, um, but it was definitely noticeable that folks were putting on jackets. Um, and so, uh, it, it is a measurable temperature and that is part of a, a citizen science project is to actually measure the temperature as you're going, um, as this is, is going along, especially with, you know, animal reactions is to figure out what, what they're actually reacting to. Uh, here's a really good one, uh, kind of based on the, uh, something you said earlier, Forrest, Wa Forrest Walker um, 111 on YouTube asks, if a flare were to happen right now, would it be visible? Could we, would we be able to see it during this, um, during the eclipse that we're watching? So if we were to be able to see a visible light flare when the eclipse was <laughs> happening, um, that would be a big event. <laughs> um, so <laughs> um, that would that would be related to. So, for instance, one of the most powerful uh, or the most powerful events that we kind of have recorded is the 1859 Carrington event, um, where telephone <laughs> uh, telegraph lines at the times caught on fire and were able to work without batteries for days based on the energy that was imparted from that flare to the Earth. Wow. Um, so if we were to see some see an actual flare um in the visible light that is what they was seen associated with that as well so that's a big storm <laughs> um so uh so it'd be super cool yet at the same time it would be uh very interesting to, to see what, what would go on. Most of the flares we um, look at right now are done in the extreme ultraviolet. Um, and uh, that is how we, we normally see them, which is unfortunately something we can't see with our own eyes. So one thing you've mentioned a couple of times and people are asking questions about it is a prominence. So what is a prominence? Is that a flare that we are seeing on the left side of the sun or what, what, is, what is a prominence? What are we seeing? Good question. Yeah. So a prominence is a protrusion of some of the gas of the sun along a magnetic field line. So the sun is a magnetic star um, and uh, the, the background image you're actually seeing has kind of those twisty magnetic fields and the, the gas or the plasma following those. And that's what a, pl a prominence is. It's a sticking out of one of those magnetic fields and then the gas uh, and plasma sticking with it, sticking with that magnetic field line and protruding. Um, and so it can be a precursor to a flare. Um, it could be a um, it could be part of a coronal mass ejection. It could be ejected from the sun um, as as a mass um, that comes through uh, through the solar system. Um, it's equivalent to uh, 80 million school buses um, in mass hurling at us yeah. at a million miles an hour uh, when a coronal mass ejection goes off, and a prominence can be part of that. Um, so that's why it's just interesting. It is an active uh, part and um, there was some active regions rotating off the disc and I think it was just about that area. Um, so I was, I was interested to see what we would see uh, once we got to totality. So, and we're getting close. We're getting really close now. I know, it's so close. All right, Shariah on Twitter asks, are we able to see sunspots during a solar eclipse? We are actually able to see sunspots um, most days, so which is which is great. Um, so when the sun leaves leaves again, or sorry, when the moon leaves again, and we can see the sun, um, we there were some uh, darker features on the sun, little little spots, and so you are able to see sunspots um, in the visible light. And um, even with your eclipse glasses, you should be able to see uh, go out and see when there are large sunspots on the um, on the sun. 
Okay, we've got another question on safety. Dobby330 on Twitter asks, is there any part during an eclipse that is safe to directly look at the sun without glasses? Yes, and we are almost there. So when that moon is totally covering the disk of the sun, it is safe to take off your glasses and to see the, the solar corona. Now, again, we have to really make sure that we're on the path and we know that there is totality and that we can't see anything. Um, and one good test is if you have your glasses on and you're looking at the sun and there is no, nothing coming through those glasses, that is when you can take it, then you could take it off. If you see the littlest light in that glasses, because um, they're really dark, you're not gonna see, you're not gonna see normal lights um, but you will see the sun through them. Um, but when you don't, that's that's a sign that you can take off your glasses. Um, we're close. Uh, well, let's let's do another one. Gabrielle Codina on YouTube asks: Is it possible to encounter an eclipse and northern lights at the same time? Ooh, that would be like a really great thing to do. Um, so yeah, so we would just need to have um, an eclipse uh, over. You normally see aurora in the northern or most southern latitude, latitudes, northern or southern lights. Um, so if we were to have an, uh, an eclipse that passed uh, through, say, Alaska or uh, Greenland or Iceland, um, you might be able to catch both the eclipse and the aurora. We're close. All right, let's 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 see if we can squeeze another one in. This is a really good one. Shades McCoy on Twitch is asking about um, have we discovered any planets that experience total eclipses or eclipses like Earth does? He, uh, it feels pretty rare. It does. And actually, I, my, my colleague, Michael, said this the other day that realized that this is the only place in the solar system that this happens. Like how special is that that we get to that we get to be here um, and have a moon that blocks out the sun? Like that's not it's not something that's done every day um, or or any place else uh, that we know of. So um, so this is very very amazing. Um, and we do use eclipse like things to measure um, to actually find exoplanets or other planets around other stars um, because as they pass by they weaken the the light from the star and we use that to actually sense that they're there. Um, so we use an eclipse like um, scenario, but we don't know of of really any other yeah. eclipses. Interesting. All right. So it looks like we're getting like really close to totality. We so are. let's take a quick look at the feeds coming in from Australia. Um, Kelly, do you want to tell us what we're looking at um, and kind of talk us through that through this? this yes, awesome. definitely. So we're, we're getting really close. Um, so the dark uh, upper left hand side, um, you see the moon and then that little sliver is still the sun. And then the prominence again, that that uh, little uh, stick out of magnetic field and plasma is at the left. It looks like a little jet maybe coming off of the sun. Um, and as we're getting closer again, we're trying to um, see those Bailey's beads, which tells us a little bit of, of the surface um, of the moon and how it's peaks and valleys. It's not a perfect polished sphere. Um, it's, uh, it has a history. Um, and, uh, and we're going to see that uh, shown through the uh, shown through the Bailey's beads and then uh, eventually just go to one uh, diamond ring and then we will go into totality. So again, we're getting real close, about two minutes. Wow, and you can still see the prominence. You can see the prominence more and more. And I'm, I'm actually seeing a little bit of something also almost directly across from it. Um, there's a, a kind of a band of activity that uh, that happens uh, as these things form. And so it's it's kind of in that same band. So I think of it as almost uh, directly horizontal, but we'll see as, as we get closer if, if that comes out at all um, and can see a little bit better. Um, no, we're really getting dark. And so if we're in Australia, um, it's probably again, dropped in temperature a little um, on that beach that we saw Henry, mm -hmm. um, Henry was at. Um, and again, any animals might just start to think that it's nighttime. Um, the air uh, or the the light will actually get really um, kind of it just feels eerie um, and it's it's like your your brain knows that something's just not quite right like I, I'm not sure about this you know where did the sun go and why is it a, in kind of a different color um, and it's getting really really close and uh, 
and it's uh it's exciting to uh to experience this live with y'all yeah and we're still glasses on right we are still glasses on at this point in time um you will still be able to see that thin yeah and so we're almost there oh and now it has gone dark oh that's still too bright we probably should still have our glasses on uh but those are the bailey's beads and we are going towards those beads diamond ring and there we go. There is your total total eclipse. So glasses off at this point in time, experiencing this beautiful Corona. Um, so that prominence is out there. Um, you see that you also see on the other side, um, almost like helmets uh, or um, triangular shaped flows. Uh, so the solar wind is uh, flowing out. And so we're, we're really witnessing that Corona there. Um, and as they adjust, um, adjust things, wow there's just all sorts of structure so it's not a simple thing right it's a very complicated dynamic always churning always moving um always evolving um and you see so much structure out and this is what hopefully that kite is um is recording right now is all of these different um uh prominences and you almost see loops sometimes um and uh and then again things that look like they flow out of the out of the um picture um that's mm -hmm. the solar wind and that's what connects with our planet um and now we're actually getting the bailey's bees back so this would be glasses on again it was a very short but amazing experience um and again we're, we're gonna have around uh four and a half minutes in places in the u.s uh, in 2024, but that was beautiful. So yeah, so the Bailey's beads are coming back. We're coming back now into what is more of the more beads coming back. And you can still see a little bit of the Corona, but again, we would have our glasses on at this point in time because this is the safest, uh, the safe, this or, or your glasses are the safest way to view, um, the solar eclipse. Wow, this is just phenomenal. Absolutely it spectacular. Never it is. No. It is amazing. Wow. How many eclipses have you seen? So I have seen uh, two total eclipses in person. Wow. And, yeah. And, and each one is, this is magical and there is just something about experiencing it um that is surreal um oh wow yeah so yeah. there is the prominence and all of the other type of uh mass that's just kind of hanging out there and and um playing on the loops the magnetic loops of the sun and um yeah it's beautiful that is absolutely phenomenal Yes. And, and this activity kind of picks up as we go towards solar max. And so, um, with predictions right now, solar max is somewhere between 2024 and 2025. So we could have a very active, um, and really structured and, and a lot of different things, um, on the sun, uh, as we have our, uh, total eclipse in 24 and our annular eclipse in, in 23. So t can you talk us through that a little bit? So you're talking about solar max. So uh, the sun has cycles, the solar cycles. What's the difference and what does solar max mean? And yes, yeah. So the sun uh, sun has cycles in its magnetic um, energy. Um, what happens is basically the magnetic fields get twisted, 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 and then suddenly they, they have to just break and relax. Um, and so the uh, minimum is when they're relaxed and the, the maximum is as they are getting more and more twisted and more energy uh, to, to blow off the steam uh, through coronal mass ejections. Those again, 80 million school buses racing towards us at millions of miles an hour, um, or the solar flares or the energetic particles that the sun gives off. Um, and so this cycle that going from that really relaxed magnetic field to really tense um, takes um, 11 years to complete. Um, so you end up going uh, around five to six years to a, um, to a maximum and then back to a minimum and back to a maximum again. And we're headed towards a maximum in 2020, uh, 2024, 2025. Um, and so that's, again, we're going to have a lot more activity, um, more flares, more coronal mass ejections, and those energetic particles. 
Well, okay, so let's keep watching as we take a few more um, questions. Here's a really good one. Aaron Polito on YouTube asks, what useful data does NASA get and what did they do with it from, from um, observing eclipses? That's a great question. Um, and we take all sorts of different um, data during eclipses. Um, there will be an announcement soon of, of things that we're specifically doing for the 24. But for instance, for the kite um, that is flying in Australia uh, today, um, there will be a spectrometer. So there'll be, there'll be data from that. And that will all have to go into an archive for NASA and uh, to make sure that's open and available to, to folks. Um, so any of the things, uh, any the data that is collected from uh, from a NASA source will then be uh, available to use for anyone um, uh, shortly after it is collected. Oh wow! Um, okay, and I've heard that um, eclipses provide kind of like a perfect scientific environment um, for for taking measurements. If we're trying to do certain types of measurements, um, why is that? It, it It is a really great environment in terms of we don't normally get to turn off the sun on things uh, regularly. Um, that's a we don't get to snap our fingers and just uh, turn night to day or day to night. Um, so for instance, uh, in 23 and 24, we will launch um, rockets into the eclipse and be able to study our ionosphere, um, which is a layer of our atmosphere where a lot of our communication signals go through. Um, and if that, that gets disturbed from a day to night transition, we get to be able to study it very easily during an eclipse because that's again like a, a very specific time where we know it's going to happen and we know it's um and we can uh study those effects and uh and that's a you know a very known time to to do these things so it's it's great uh, to have as an as an experimental um laboratory for us yeah that's so cool and i love that like you, we don't get to turn off the sun that is so true um, okay, so an Arctic floof on YouTube asks, once totality has happened, how long will it take for the sun and the moon to be back to their normal, and I'm using air quotes, positions? Mm -hmm. Um, right. So it, this will take about another hour or two uh, to uh, move the moon uh, off of the sun or the uh, what will uh, what will then be to look like two separate things again. Okay. Um, Road Call Life on Twitter is asking, does totality last longer in the middle of the path of totality than along the edge of the path of totality? Or is it the same of it, same everywhere? So like, how does that work? How does, yes, that's, what a, we that's see a great question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so in the very middle of the middle of the track is where it will be longest, and then it will be shortest on the outside of the track. Um, so when we were mm -hmm. looking at the map earlier, the very center is where you're going to get the longest totality, um, the very center line, and then as it goes out, um, you will get kind of less and less um, uh, time in totality, um, and then once you're out of the track completely, that's when you get a partial eclipse, like a 90% um, or 99% eclipse. Excellent. Well, Kelly, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Anytime. I'll watch an Italy clips anytime with you, Denise. <laughs> <laughs> it's a date. <laughs> All right, you can keep watching the remainder of the solar eclipse right here on NASA TV or wherever you're watching the stream from today. Uh, if you want to learn more about eclipses, visit solarsystem.nasa.gov slash eclipses. And you can also follow NASA Sun on Facebook and Twitter to stay updated on the upcoming eclipse events and the latest sun science. Thank you all so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. The Heliophysics Big Year is a global celebration of solar science and the sun's influence on Earth and throughout the solar system, and we want you to be a part of it. We challenge you to participate in as many sun science activities as possible, beginning with the annular eclipse in 2023 and ending with Parker Solar Probe's closest approach to the sun in December 2024. Space is increasingly part of the human domain. 
By studying the sun's influence in space and its interactions with planets, we learn how to better protect astronauts and robotic missions from space weather and to develop technology that protects the very infrastructure we rely on here on Earth, such as power grids and GPS signals. NASA's heliophysics division studies the sun's influence on everything in our solar system, from the very core of the sun to the very edge where the sun's atmosphere meets interstellar space. We have 20 heliophysics missions that are operational and 14 more under development. The Heliophysics Big Year will highlight the work that we're doing to understand our star and to mitigate the effects of space weather. The Big Year is a concept that originated with citizen scientists in the bird watching community. During their Big Year, birders attempt to observe and study as many species as possible during a calendar year, and we are challenging you to do the same with our sun. During the Heliophysics Big Year, you will have the opportunity to participate in many solar science events, like watching solar eclipses, experiencing an aurora, participating in citizen science projects, and lots of other fun sun-related activities. So please be sure to look out for opportunities to be part of our Heliophysics Big Year.
Imagine you are on the moon. Your job for the next eight hours will be exploring, traversing up and down lunar hills, sampling rocks, and setting up equipment. Temperatures can reach a blistering 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Luckily, you have a portable life support system, a backpack that provides oxygen, water, power, and for the excruciating temperatures, a cooling system. Under the Artemis program, NASA and its partners are planning to return astronauts to the moon, and the agency is testing new spacesuit technologies. As a new age of exploration heats up, engineers are looking to improve how to keep astronauts cool in space. Outside the International Space Station, astronauts perform extravehicular activities, EVAs, also known as spacewalks. During the Apollo era, spacewalks took place on the lunar surface, and with the Artemis program, humankind will once again return to live and work in the harsh environment of the moon. Future plans call for spacewalks to last longer and be more demanding, not just on the astronauts, but also on the spacesuits and systems that protect them and keep them alive and healthy. NASA has been working on advanced technologies needed for next generation spacesuits. NASA's reference design, the Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Unit, or the XEMU, features greater mobility, visibility, and flexibility. This prototype is just the beginning. To meet the needs of future exploration as part of the Artemis program, NASA will share its newest designs, research, and data with commercial industry, whom NASA will partner with to build the next generation spacesuit. It is an effort that will benefit from NASA's most recent studies and the agency's 50 plus years of spacewalk experience. Spacesuits are essentially a spacecraft made for one. They have many important life-preserving components, but none is more complex than the system to regulate the temperature of the astronaut. Engineers call this cooling system the thermal control loop. The thermal control loop is part of the portable life support system or the backpack that the astronaut wears when they do an EVA. The thermal control loop is designed to keep the astronauts cool. When the astronauts are doing spacewalks, they can be exposed to extreme temperature swings, say up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. The thermal control loop is part of a system that consists of a liquid cooling ventilation garment, or LCBG, that the astronauts wear under the spacesuit. It consists of tubes that are filled with water that circulate from water pumps in the backpack to keep the astronauts cool. During the Gemini program, engineers realized that astronauts not only needed protection from the temperatures of space, but also from the heat generated inside the suit, from their own bodies as they worked. Originally, the suit designers thought that airflow over the astronaut's body would keep temperatures regulated. What they discovered was that air cooling in a spacesuit is insufficient to do that job. During the Apollo era, it was decided running cool water through a garment that covers the body could help keep the astronauts from overheating. The means of cooling the astronaut was now an essential life-sustaining element to the spacesuit and was here to stay. The spacesuit currently in use on the space station, developed in the 1970s, also uses a water-cooled garment. Circulating water is still the best way to cool an astronaut. However, improvements can be made on how to move that water through the system, using new technologies and materials to test how to make the essential cooling system safer and more reliable than ever before. The result of this research is SURFI, the Spacesuit Evaporation Rejection Flight Experiment, all the critical elements of a spacesuit cooling system in one box. Two SURFI units have been built, one to work here on Earth in our gravity, and another SURFI unit meant to be tested in the absence of gravity, in space. On board the International Space Station, astronauts take advantage of the microgravity environment to perform a variety of science experiments, 
and to test exploration technologies. When engineers developed the spacesuits for the Apollo and Space Shuttle eras, NASA did not have a space station in operation. Today, the station presents a perfect platform for engineers to use microgravity to put the SURFI cooling system to the test. In that experiment, we will test a couple different versions of the water pump that will be used to circulate the water through the system. We'll test uh, temperature sensors, we'll test pressure sensors, integrate all those into one little package and test them for long duration to see how they'll perform over the expected life of a spacesuit. Surfy shows how the water will move through the system as if it were inside a spacesuit, cooling the astronaut. But a spacesuit cooling system needs to do more than just circulate water. As the astronaut works, their body generates heat, which is transferred into the liquid cooling and ventilation garment. A thermal control loop needs a way to remove the heat from the water that is circulating through the system. That's where SWIMI comes in, the spacesuit water membrane evaporator. SWIMI consists of some porous hollow fiber membranes that are contained in a metal manifold. When warm water flows through the porous membranes, and then is exhausted into space, the cool water continues through the porous fibers and continues to flow through the LCVG liquid ventilation garment to cool the astronaut. With the means to run a cooling system and offload heat and gases, the SURFI unit runs for eight hours at a time, the span of what a spacewalk might last in space or on the moon. The tests are run again and again, simulating the rigors of what a spacesuit thermal control loop might encounter during its life cycle. Astronauts take water samples from SURFI for analysis. Just as a spacesuit might sit in storage for a time between spacewalks, like during a trip to the moon or Mars, SURFI is sometimes switched off. This time of dormancy is when contaminants can grow in the system. That's when the bugs, the microbes, grow in the water system. And those little guys grow and they reproduce and they can grow through the system they'll clog your filters, and once your filters get clogged, the water stops flowing. When the water stops flowing, the suit stops cooling. Contaminants in the water are such a problem for current spacesuits that astronauts set aside time for regular water maintenance chores every 90 days. The SURFI tests hope to demonstrate that new technologies and materials will be far more robust in working through water contamination issues, reducing the risk of the cooling loop failing. We don't want to have to worry about water quality. We want to be able, we've joked among the team, we want to be able to pour chicken soup into the Exploration EMU and it'll still run the way it's supposed to run. Even if there's microbes in there that the system doesn't care. So we want the filters to catch the microbes and if the filters don't catch the microbes and they flow through the pumps, the pumps don't even notice the microbes or the contamination or whatever's in the water. They keep operating the way they're supposed to operate. We want our crews to be spending their time exploring, not running maintenance procedures on our spacesuits. All the testing for SURFI in space is duplicated on Earth, with a twin SURFI running in 1G, Earth's gravity. By testing here and simultaneously testing in the microgravity of the space station, engineers can infer how the cooling unit will run in the one-sixth gravity of the moon, the one-third gravity of Mars, and all points in between. The knowledge gained from building and testing the twin SURFI units is already paying off as work is underway building a full-size backpack for NASA's prototype exploration spacesuit. How's it gonna perform in microgravity? Well, by sending SURFI to space station, we can actually test how it's gonna perform in microgravity. That in itself buys down the risks. So now there's one less unknown that we have to worry about when we send our hardware off to do what it's supposed to do. I am so excited that uh, SURFI, SWIMI is on orbit, that we're working great, our ground unit is working great. SURFI has made a difference. We've had engineers, scientists, thermal analysis, water experts. It's been an exciting multi-discipline collaboration. It's a collaboration that will inform spacesuit technologies for the moon and beyond. A new design for a thermal control loop and its ability to help regulate temperatures for astronauts during exploration can benefit from the data gathered from SURFI, making it one cool little experiment.
This is the science mission on par with Apollo missions, Space Shuttle, International Space Station, and Hubble missions. For nearly two decades, thousands of people around the world, many have spent their entire careers, built the James Webb Space Telescope. And it all comes down to this. Once we launch the James Webb Space Telescope, there are no second chances. We have 300 single point failure items, and they all have to work right. When you're a million miles away from the Earth, you can't send someone to fix it. We've never put a telescope this large in space. We want to see distant parts of the universe humans have never seen before. Looking back in time almost 14 billion years to see the first galaxies that formed after the Big Bang. And we want to search for the building blocks of life in the atmospheres of planets orbiting distant stars. To unfold the history of the universe, we must first unfold this telescope. This is the largest primary mirror, the largest sun shield, and the most powerful space telescope ever built. And yet, this large telescope needs to fit inside a 5.4 meter diameter rocket fairing. That's the largest fairing size available on any rocket, and it's the fairing size on our ride to space. The Ariane 5, provided by the European Space Agency, is one of the world's most powerful rockets. To cheat the fairing size limit, we build Webb to fold like origami to fit inside the rocket fairing. And this brings us to our most challenging part of this mission, unfolding it in space. This thank God. Think of what you're doing. You're taking this extraordinarily delicate, precise, state-of-the-art scientific instrument, you're slapping it on a rocket, and for the next eight minutes, the explosion from that rocket is following you into outer space. Vibrating you shaking you. Everything that goes in outer space has to live through this environment and work once it gets there without having someone come to fix it. Two weeks. That's how long it will take to fully deploy the Webb telescope. We can take longer if we need to, but those two weeks after launch are going to be nail biters. This is the Mission Operations Center at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. Those two weeks after launch will be like our Super Bowl, World Cup, you pick the analogy. Years of training comes down to these moments. The Webb Observatory has 50 major deployments, 50 depending on how you categorize them, and 178 release mechanisms must work to deploy those 50 parts. Every single one of them must work. Unfolding web is hands down the most complicated spacecraft activity we've ever done. Then again, nothing about web is easy. We've never done any of this before. There's nothing simple about sending anything into space. You can't do it without taking risks. This mission is squarely in new spacecraft territory. Webb is the perfect example of science desire driving engineering capability to new frontiers. Webb's unique design was born from reasoned engineering to accomplish its science goals. Here's the plan. Shortly after launch, we unfold Webb's solar panel for power and our Huygen antenna for communication. About 12 hours later, we have an important engine firing that sends Webb on the proper course towards its orbital destination, about a million miles away. That's where Webb will do its science. Webb will be moving so fast, it passes the moon's orbit in one and a half days, half the time it took Apollo astronauts to reach lunar orbit. First, we lower the sun shield pallet, then raise Webb's primary mirror and instruments away from the sun shield. The solar wind will push us around with the sunshield open, so we'll unfold a trim tab to help keep us stable. 
we got these huge, iconic, golden segmented mirrors that will help us deliver amazing new images from the cosmos. But in some ways, the sun shield is a lot more complicated and it's just as essential. Without it, nothing works. Here we've got five sun shield layers, of approximately 8,900 square feet, almost the size of three tennis courts, a very thin Kapton material, about one to two thousandths of an inch thick. Making them go where you want them to go in zero G is extremely challenging. The sun shield shades the telescope from the heat of the sun, earth, and moon. The concept is simple, but there is nothing simple about the design or operation, especially when you get to space. Webb's sun shield assembly includes 140 release mechanisms, approximately 70 hinge assemblies, eight deployment motors, bearings, springs, gears, about 400 pulleys, and 90 cables totaling 1,312 feet. All this just to keep the sun shield under control as it unfolds. First, we release these special restraints that protect the sun shield during launch. They roll out of the way, but not all the way until we are ready to deploy a side. Next, we release a set of covers over the core region. Now comes the critical point. All 107 sun shield release mechanisms need to fire on cue. 107. They free the five sun shield layers, allowing them to extend as the mid booms deploy. Sunshield fully deployed, we start setting up the optics. First, the secondary mirror is extended and locked into place. And a special radiator behind web is extended, which helps further lower the temperature of the science instruments. Finally, we open the primary mirror's wings and lock them in place. With that done, web is in its final configuration, but we're not done yet. After 47 deployments, and accomplishing the hardest spacecraft unfolding NASA has ever done, Webb still won't be ready for science. While the instruments cool, we'll control motors behind each of Webb's 18 mirror segments, the secondary mirror, and the fine steering mirror located inside the center of the primary mirror. We'll precisely align the mirror segments to form a perfect mirror. Then, Webb will be ready to explore the cosmos. This is my first opportunity to greet you as Deputy Administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Together, you and I must make our new agency the most unusual place. An organization that can challenge conventional wisdom. We can engineer anything. We can write the requirements for We're going to make your idea work. This particular idea is quite disruptive. A typical flight, of course, starts under the wing of the B-52 mothership. This sleek, high-speed machine would have made Rube Goldberg proud. The manner in which we fly re-entry from space on the space shuttle was pioneered on the X-15. X-31 pretty much wrote the book on thrust vectoring, along with its sister program, the F-18. Heart. An observation of an occultation is one of the more challenging missions that Sophia can do. Right now, we are looking at the dawn of new era of aviation. Flight loads is a crucial discipline. It is one of the areas that requires a good combination of both science and art 
We often say that every airplane that we have ultimately goes through the loads lab. In 1964, a new building was rising from the desert shore of Rogers Dry Lake. The tests this laboratory has conducted over the past 50 years have supported almost every type of vehicle the aerospace industry has to offer. We do a lot of testing in the laboratories to make sure that components are going to withstand the environments that they will see. Every time we go away from the standard configuration on a vehicle, it changes the loads, and we've got to understand how that affects the forces and stresses and things going on within the airplane. We in the Flight Loads Lab have been interested in thermal testing for many years. These specimens are being exposed to temperatures from 400 degrees to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. In order to precisely calibrate the thermal effects on the strain gauges, ground heating tests were conducted. Also over the years there's been low temperature testing using cryogenic cooling capability. A cooling system was used to lower the glove temperature to the minus 30 degree Fahrenheit pre-launch condition. The heating and cooling systems work together to bring the entire glove to cold soak condition. The type of loads that a wing will experience in flight are bending loads, torsion loads and shear loads. They're loads that are applied to the wings as a result of the air loads that are put onto the airplane when it's flying or when it's maneuvering. How far can we push it? Where is it going to fail and how is it going to fail? So this work here has really been key to be able to help us anchor the models that we're developing to analyze the performance of these structures and also to take that next step and optimize the design of these systems. The second HIMAT aircraft underwent extensive ground vibration testing after its delivery to the UL Dryden Flight Research Center. Any aircraft in flight has resonant modes which occur as its structure flexes under aerodynamic loads. These flexures can become rapid and large. Under extreme conditions, they may even result in structural failure. In Dryden's Flight Loads Research Facility, mechanical vibrators are attached to portions of the aircraft structure. As the aircraft structure is excited at known amplitudes and frequencies, its mechanical responses are carefully measured and tabulated. So we're trying to understand how the airplane rings basically like a bell. You actually want to see the structural characteristics and how it behaves. Once you go and fly, if you experience any like flutter or dangerous vibration motion, then it's practically too late. We can tell if the structure is sound. With all this data, we'll be able to update our models, which will be used in our flutter analysis to validate that we are good and can give flight clearance for the vehicle. Inertia testing, understanding basically how the mass is distributed around the vehicle, which gets important for the control laws. The moment of inertia essentially tells us the angular momentum properties of the vehicle. We want to understand during flight, when we're trying to control it, how it pitches up and down, we want to understand how much resistance and inertia happens during those pitching maneuvers. We need to know for certain that our sensors are behaving properly so that when we put them on our structures or put them on our vehicles, we actually believe the data that's coming off. Not only test a large test article, but to bring in some new test techniques like the FOSS and really calibrate that against more traditional strain measurements and the finite element modeling. The Flight Loads Lab here at NASA Armstrong performs some of the most sophisticated tests that I've seen on, on vehicles, flight vehicles, as well as entry vehicles. This facility is not only very unique, but it's a national treasure. A milestone for our experimental supersonic airplane, stretching Orion's wings before the next flight, and technologies to help fight wildfires. A few of the stories to tell you about this week at NASA. The experimental X-59 aircraft being built for our Quest mission has been outfitted with its lower empennage or tail assembly. Teams can now continue final wiring and system checkouts in preparation for integrated ground testing. The X-59 is designed to demonstrate the ability to fly supersonic and produce just a quiet sonic thump instead of a loud sonic boom. 
Teams at our Kennedy Space Center recently tested a solar array wing to make sure it extends correctly. Four of the solar arrays will be installed on the Orion spacecraft for the Artemis II mission. Artemis II will be the first Artemis mission to carry astronauts around the moon and back to Earth. The ACERO project, led by our Ames Research Center, is using drones and advanced aviation technologies to improve wildfire fighting coordination and operations. ACERO's airspace management technologies provide situational awareness to help responders avoid conflicts with aircraft operations. Having this situational awareness could also enable them to safely integrate drones into the firefighting effort. Our Lucy spacecraft recently captured its first look at four of the Jupiter Trojan asteroids the mission plans to visit. From more than 330 million miles away, the spacecraft spotted Eurybates, Ptolemy, Lucas, and Oris. The asteroids are just a single points of light, but the team can still use the imaging data to prepare for the future up-close observations of Lucy's targets. I'm Christina Cook. I'm a mission specialist. I'm Jeremy Hansen. I'm a mission specialist. I'm Victor Glover. I'm the pilot. I'm Reed Wiseman. I'm the commander for the Artemis II mission to the moon. To the moon. To the moon. To the moon. When I was young, I had a poster of the Earthrise picture, the famous picture that was taken on Apollo 8. And the fact that it was a human behind the lens that made that picture so profound and changed how we all thought of our own home was so amazing to me. The moon is not just a symbol of thinking about our place in the universe. It's not just a symbol of exploration. It's actually a beacon for science. It's a beacon for understanding where we came from. You know, pushing ourselves to explore is just core to who we are. It's a part of being a human. That's our nature. We go out there and we explore to learn about where we are, why we are, understanding the big questions about our place in the universe. The exploration we're doing is the first few steps on the path of getting humans to Mars. The Artemis campaign of missions have set such an ambitious goal for humanity that it's inspiring contributions from around the globe. Not just one nation is inspired and moved by this, but nations from around the globe are coming together. When I look at the Artemis II crew with Victor, Christina, and Jeremy, they want to go do this mission. They are keenly driven. They are humble to a fault. It is so cool to be around them. Artemis II is a huge mission, but I hope we will look back and realize that this was one tiny step in humans on Mars and a sustained presence on our moon. Artemis II will be NASA's first crewed flight test of the Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft around the moon. To verify today's capabilities for humans to explore deep space and pave the way for NASA's long-term human and scientific presence on the lunar surface. We are ready. We are going to the moon for all humanity. We are Artemis.
Space Launch System is the next newest, biggest rocket that we're going to build. And it's not just a replacement for the Space Shuttle. This rocket is going to carry us much further than the shuttle would go. It's NASA's next big rocket for um, deep space exploration. The SLS is a national capability that provides um, a unique access to space that America has not had in 40 years. A large launch vehicle like this um, really opens the door to destinations beyond. It's not limited by destination. It's only limited really by imagination. What we're focused on here at this center is the propulsion system. And uh, that consists of two solid rocket boosters and a core with some tanks that feed uh, some liquid rocket engines in the middle. And then the astronauts sit on the top in the Orion um, uh, spacecraft. One of the things we recognized for SLS is we had to be affordable. So we had to do things differently, more efficiently, and smarter. We're all conscious about saving money doing it uh, more affordable than we have in the past. But at the same time, we can't sacrifice reliability or safety. The system uses a um, significant amount of heritage hardware, which is things that we've evolved from the Space Shuttle program. The Space Shuttle had two kind of candle-looking things, which are the solid rockets. Those are kept, and those are used on SLS. We've added a segment uh, to the four-segment solid rocket boosters that we had on shuttle. That gives it more power, more thrust, and it helps this larger rocket get off the ground. What those boosters are for is just to get you going. They burn for a couple of minutes, and then they fall to the ground. Then your liquid engines, you're up high enough, your liquid engines can carry your vehicle to as high as you want to go, and if you have additional stages, like we're going to have one, then you can go further out into space. Right now, the inventory that we've got uh, consists of 14 engines that have flown on shuttle. We've got one engine that was assembled and still needs green run testing or certification testing. We looked at all the spares. As we collected the spares, we determined that we could assemble a 16th engine. So we'll have 16 engines that we'll be able to use for flight. We are making tremendous progress. We've got all of our prime contractors on board. Um, we're testing engines, we're testing solid rocket boosters, our avionics systems. J2X has set, uh, recently set a record at Stennis. Uh, when we were testing, it was the first liquid oxygen engine to get to a full duration test in four tests. We were developing this booster under the Ares program, and, and we're moving that into the SLS vehicle. The motor itself has been through three development firings, which are full-scale motors tested out in Utah, um, um, and we've gotten a lot of good data, engineering data, from those tests. This is an adapter that goes between the bottom of the Ryan capsule and the top of the Space Launch System rocket that we're developing here at Marshall. It's been specifically designed to give strength to the adapter so that it can take the loads in flight and still be lightweight. This shape started out as a series of flat panels. Um, the isogrid pattern was machined into the surfaces. Then they were formed, it was called bump, in a process called bump forming, to make them into the shape that we need here. And we weld three of these segments together to form the cone that you see behind me. We just, uh, you know, delivered the first crew module uh, to the ONC building at KSE. We've started a lot of the uh, parts onto the outside of the uh, CM, and we've actually put it in what we call the bird cage, so we can locate all those parts, you know, within, you know, thousands of an inch to make sure that uh, everything is going together okay putting, you know, wiring inside of it, putting tubes for the, you know, for the propulsion system, putting valves and pumps, and so all of that happens in stages right there uh, in the ONC building. We have uh, on contract with USA, United Space Alliance, to build uh, our harnesses. They're set up shop in the ONC, and so their little shop delivers to, to the big shop. 
Thermal protection is very difficult in, in re-entry vehicles to, to test and to model. I mean, really, you have to, you have to fly it to really understand what's going to happen. We're building ceramic thermal insulation tiles for the back shell of the capsule. Uh, we're building thermal barriers for the capsule, and we're building multi-layer insulation for that capsule. I'm the heat shield design lead. So we're designing and building the heat shield for the future Orion missions. The heat shield right now is in uh, our big 20 by 20 router. It's a five axis router. And uh, right now it's machining uh, the interior bowl, if you will, of the heat shield. To cut out that heat shield on the, on the router, it could take weeks of machine time uh, running multiple shifts. It's the biggest heat shield uh, ever constructed. The other component is the heat shield skeleton, so that's the piece of the titanium substructure, the backbone that makes up the, the carrier structure itself. Another unique thing is all the hand drilling that we're doing, so it's not automated by a router in this case, and it all has to be, be hand, hand drilled by technicians on the inside. 200 plus titanium parts all match drilled together. So we have a a uh, tool that puts all the pieces in the right spot and then we drill and high lock them all together. MCC is transforming from uh, supporting space shuttle and space station to a platform that will support space station and MPCB or Orion. In order to adapt for the future, we need to go to a more modern system. KSC will, still, will operate the vehicle all the way up until launch. We'll operate the vehicle until splashdown and the recovery forces come in and take over after that. Fire Room 1 is the launch control room we're going to use for Orion SLS for EM-1 missions. We've been working with the Orion program to get the spacecraft data so we can, we can process it with our software in the Fire Room and we will be flight following that mission out of Fire Room 1. We refitted the room, we redid it, putting the sound suppression carpeting on the walls, making it kind of a more comfortable place to work. So we're aiming for about 50 people in Fire Room 1 for an EM-1 mission. We are actually using Fire Room 1 right now to test Pad B uh, subsystems. This part is gonna be a, almost like a complete new pad because we will have refurbished each and every system that it's inside of pad. We're going to have the vehicle uh, launch from the mobile launcher, and not only launch from the mobile launcher, but have a tower that, that will have all the services attached to the vehicle. The tower is going to be on the mobile launcher. The vehicle will be assembled at the VAB. It's a return to a concept that we knew that worked very well during the Apollo years when the mobile launch platform had a tower on it. We knew that the VAB was designed to accommodate a launch tower on a mobile launch platform. We have to make sure that the, v the VAB can remain adaptable and accommodate different vehicle architectures. And now we have a clean VAB uh, shell, per se, the, the infrastructure, so that we can accommodate the, the new hardware, the new vehicle access with uh, new platforms. And that is the first phase that we're doing now. And once the vehicle is ready with all the connections, the only thing we gotta do is move the vehicle to the pad, do the connections to the mobile launcher. And once we do those connections, we're ready to launch. There was a time where I had to explain what a crawler was. Um, if you didn't work out here at the Space Center or if you weren't in the Central Florida area, a lot of people just, uh, you know, somehow the, the vehicle got out to the pad. We knew what to expect from a, a load perspective with the new vehicle, the larger rocket and things along those lines. And that goes from the crawler lifted load, the hydraulics, also to the crawler way. Um, we're going to have to increase uh, the load and capability for the crawler way itself uh, with the rock. What we've essentially done is keep all the same hydraulic components but just in, uh, increase the size of the diameter of the hydraulic cylinders. Last November, we actually took a, took a ride out with the completed Crawler 2 out to the pad and tested out the systems and a couple punchless items, but everything worked great. 
the control system had been upgraded, the, uh, the, cabs, the driver's cab consoles had all been replaced, the brakes had all been replaced. Uh, nearly every subsystem had some kind of work done to it. The traction support elements, uh, each of the, the four corners has 22 rollers that are about the size of a car, to be honest with you, and uh, we're changing out all of those and enlarging those as well. What I love doing is reminding the outside world, whether it's within our government or especially the media, that has a perception that we're in a lull, that there's nothing going on, that the, you know, the space program's shutting down, to kind of dispel that rumor and say, no, we're, we're, this is the, the far opposite for us. We are utilizing this inter-program time frame to make all the modifications and all the infrastructure changes that it will help bring that agency vision into reality. Many of us feel the country wants to go forward and, and, and NASA has a big following and every time I talk to people they're excited about NASA. Enabling people to go beyond where they have ever gone before and look and discover things that they didn't even know existed is just, it's just a real honor. It's been a pleasure to be involved with this project and I can't say enough for the team that's put this together. I'm privileged to work this program. I think most people who are working it today feel the same way. I can't believe they pay me for this job. It's just wonderful. It's great. Very rarely do you get the opportunity to kind of literally from the ground up put together a factory whose sole purpose is to go make history and do exciting things for not just NASA, but for America and for the whole world. We're in the process of getting the factory ready for SLS production. And in that process, there's a series of new tools that we've been in, uh, installing in the factory. Now we have not just put in new tooling, there's some legacy tooling that we're using. Most of the external tank buildings are being reused. We have a lot of construction going on for those, getting ready for a rocket that's uh, same diameter, but a little bit longer. Not only are we using the legacy knowledge, the lessons learned, we're also incorporating new technologies. The, the tool that today is in the vertical friction stir welding center. And its, its job is to produce the um, cylinders that make up the parts of the tank that will be stacked. And that is going to be the tool that joins every panel on every barrel for the, the rocket. This device will actually do the weld in a single pass and then also do inspection. So these are the large barrel sections of the, the core stage that will be the foundation or the beginning rocket that will actually take our crews beyond the moon and, and really propel us into space. Here at Marshall, we've designed the interface hardware in between the Orion capsule and that upper stage. The MSA, I think, is a great example of a couple things. One, it's actually a piece of hardware that we're flying on an early test, but we're also going to fly for the long term. So this is the same design that we'll use when Orion's on the SLS and we're actually flying people. Today we've been taking the two unique pieces of hardware uh, that are supposed to have a common interface, basically lowering them together, bolting and making sure that they fit. Well, we're going to test a lot of the key systems on Orion and also for SLS with the upper stage of the MSA that are going to be used when we uh, fly people into deep space. Most recently, we've been involved with NASA with the SLS development using our unique forming technology along with our other core processes in terms of machining, welding, heat treating, and inspection technologies. Really is a one-stop shop is what you, way you would describe it. Right behind me, you have the uh, first cap, first uh, weld development cap, or I think you call it the weld confidence cap. The production order will start deliveries in 2014. Spincraft also builds the domes for the upper stage Delta IV vehicle, which will be used for the EFT-1 flight, as well as the first two production flights of the SLS program. For the SLS PDR, our primary role was the overall communication and outreach support that we provide back to Todd May's office for SLS. We provide all of the communication support for that particular team, that program and project. Well, it's a preliminary design review, and uh, primarily it's a technical review to make sure that the design is acceptable and at the appropriate level of maturity. There's a lot of discussions, there's a lot of meetings across the board from technical, cost, schedule, 
performance data, safety, human factors. It's like a health check on the program. Um, those of us that are working on the program, uh, we've got our head down, we're, we're doing our pieces. Um, and, and sometimes when you're working real close to things, you don't necessarily see everything. So there's so many moving parts and so many things going on at the agency. Um, as well as the center, that to show people that we are moving in the right direction to pull together the complete story of where we are as a program. Watching at it from a higher level uh, headquarters viewpoint, it's just gratifying to see the, the accomplishments that the, that the teams have made and continue to make every day. For CT2, we're doing modifications, not only to make it last another 20 years, but also to upgrade the load capacity. The main project we're working on right now is the roller replacement project, which is the roller assembly. It's actually the rollers, the shafts, the bearings that support the crawler. Actually, if you go there, you'll see trucks A and C jacked up and on uh, cribbing. And that's the first time in the career of the crawler it's ever actually been jacked off the ground. So the guys have easy access to the, um, the rollers, roller assemblies. And they're in the process now of removing the old rollers, old shafts and old parts. Um, once they've uh, done the line boring, that's when they'll start assembling the new rollers and the new shafts and the new bearings and the new sleeves and new adapters and new plates. So there's quite a bit of work and that work will go well from August through October. So there's going to be a lot of trucks delivering a lot of steel uh, here at Kennedy. We started actually the new design for flame deflector as well as uh, refurbishment of the flame trench and that's because of the new requirements for SLS and uh, commercial vehicles. We've started the demolition of the flame deflector. We've got concerns of, you know, due to age and the debonding of the flame trench structure, this would possibly be a safety hazard for, um, you know, our new program. And that's why we had to go in and do a new design and refurbish this flame deflector and flame trench. These pieces here, they're not just one program, it's not just one mission, it's part of a capability that will enable this country to be a leader in space, to continue to take people from the Earth well beyond low Earth orbit out into deep space. And this is the hardware that will do that over multiple decades in the future. So the work that's been accomplished so far is primarily structural type work, right? It's a lot of drilling, a lot of secondary structure installation, mechanical structures, the support structures. The next step is starting to install the subsystems. When we actually perform the welding on tubes for propulsion and the environmental controls and life support systems, um, those have to be at a higher level of cleanliness. When you look at the facility, um, there are these very large walls that are that are on the perimeter of the structure itself, and, and those are called HEPA filter walls. We can perform clean room work for the tubing um, concurrently uh, while on the outside doing more standard clean room. So our goal is next summer sometime um, to turn the vehicle over, early summer, over to the ground operations organization so they can start their processing. Well, the service module is attached below the crew module and it has the prop tanks and the engine, radiators, solar panels. The service module all came in pieces. You know, there's 49 composite panels on the, on the SM. The actual structure itself is aluminum. That's the core skeleton where these composite panels were attached to. After it, the CM releases and the CM returns to Earth, the, the SM will just burn up with the, with the upper stage of the uh, Delta IV. We performed two primary tests so far. The proof pressure test, which is just the pressure vessel, and that is, that is put into the proof pressure cell. It, it's, it's pressurized and a relatively high pressure. We're testing how well the vehicle was built. And then the follow-on test is the static loads test 
where the vehicle goes through eight different loads test cases. And so the vehicle is put under, under pressure, it's put under tension, it's put under compression. The whole intent is to simulate similar conditions that the vehicle would experience, say, in flight, in launch, in, in, and also in landing and recovery. We, we usually get the abort motor first, and for this mission, the abort motor is inert. Uh, being a nominal flight. We're going to have instrumentation on it to again understand more about the loads and environments that we expect to see in flight, but it will be an inert uh, propellant that's cast into the motor. This time we got the jettison motor next, and that's the only live component of this vehicle. We do a, a nominal jettison, the jettison motor fires, the last separates from the CM, and the CM continues on its mission. You know, one of the challenges of any new system is understanding the loads uh, as you ascend up through the atmosphere and, and the dynamics, the acoustics, and uh, we'll be able to gather a lot of that information. The back shell, it looks, though, though it looks the same as what we flew on shuttle, it is different. We kind of took the best aspects and put them together to meet uh, Lockheed Martin's requirements for, for the Orion capsule. Two major things we're trying to accomplish here. One of them is to prevent micrometeorite damage when we're on orbit for long duration. The other, would, of course, is, is the reentry aspect. The skin that you see on the capsule, what you would see on orbit, sits on top of a composite substrate, what we call the back shell panel. That, that, that when combined together gives you the complete back shell. There's some sections that have some very complex geometry. So what we're going to do for the first time is take a substrate that's built by Lockheed Martin and put it together with the tiles that are manufactured by Jacobs and, and validate the fit up. Like any test vehicle, you're, you're heavily instrumented. We're gonna come back with a tremendous amount of data on how, how the system performed. This first flight test of Orion is really to, to understand how the heat shield performs and that heat shield's being going to final manufacturing at Textron. Textron's had a long association with NASA and working in the uh, space area for space protection. Uh, the technology today has advanced tremendously. Our manufacturing technology has advanced, but ironically, we're still using a material that has proven itself for the last 40 years. Avcoat is a uh, very efficient ablator, and as an ablator, uh, what it does, it allows us to protect the capsule from the high heating that occurs during re-entry. There is no material, non-ablator material, that can handle that kind of heat. You have to shed away uh, the heat. Basically, what you're doing is you peel off the layers of the heat shield. You're taking heat with it. When we apply Avcoat to the heat shield, uh, we bond the honeycomb onto the carrier structure, and then we inject the Avcoat ablative material into the cells. The honeycomb acts as a, a crack arrester and gives it rigidity and, and strength as a whole. We know we're on the critical path for the Orion program, and so our employees are literally working all hours, all days of the week to make sure that we get our schedule. We know there'll be more heat shields coming, and we're very excited about that. Our job is to make sure they're perfect. The development programs I find uh, uh, just awesome because this is where you're coming up with the new ideas, you're creating the, the new vehicles, you're, 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 pushing, you're pushing the boundaries in essence. You can feel that we're going to go do this. The hardware is starting to come, the Orion hardware is getting ready for its first flight test down at the Kennedy Space Center. The excitement is here. We are really ready to get going. So we are far from being out of space. We are really getting ready to go into space. That's so rewarding to see our focus into what's next because this really is our future. I know the day that we fly this thing, there are going to be thousands of people that are going to be excited that are working on this and the NASA workforce and the contractor workforce. We're going to be proud of the work that this team has done and I think we're going to be proud of our country too. It's going to be a pretty exciting time. I'm ready to build a rocket and we are ready and we want to build it on time. Hi, I'm Lori. I study the planets, our solar system, and I especially love volcanoes. And this is Ask NASA. The thing 
I love the most about our solar system is that it's an incredible natural laboratory. We have so many different types of objects in the solar system from planets and moons and asteroids and comets. We can study each one of those and they all have something they can tell us about how the solar system formed or how Earth ended up in its special place and understanding why the other planets are different from Earth actually helps us better understand how we ended up the way we are today. So this is a globe of Mars right here. And uh, many of the reasons why we're so interested in Mars, there's a lot of different processes going on on Mars that help us better understand Earth. A lot of the surface of Mars has been preserved for almost 4 billion years. And so we can study a lot of things on Mars that you can't even find on Earth. Touch on confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. So Perseverance rover is going to drive around and find some of the best rocks it can, drill down into the rock and soil and collect those samples so that on our next mission, Mars Sample Return, we'll be able to bring those back and study them in our laboratories here on Earth. There is volcano on Mars. In fact, there's lots of volcanoes on Mars. The largest volcano we know of in our whole solar system is on Mars. It's called Olympus Mons, and it is so giant that the entire chain of Hawaiian islands could fit inside the crater at the top of that volcano. We see volcanoes really across the solar system on all of our rocky bodies. So on Mercury, we see evidence of lava flows on the surface of Mercury. Even on the moon, we have lava flows that we can see. On Venus, we see the entire surface of Venus is covered with lots of volcanoes and volcanic deposits. So this is a globe of the moon Io. Io is the moon of Jupiter. That's the most volcanically active body in our solar system. And that's because the pull of Jupiter's gravity on Io as it goes around Jupiter tugs and pulls at Io and, and that heats up the inside and that drives volcanoes. The heat needs to be released. This is the volcano Pele. Um, and there's lava flows down here in the middle, but then there's also this big red orange deposit, which is actually from explosive eruption of the gases that are falling down onto the surface of Io around the volcano. And it has no atmosphere. So if you were to turn it like this and look at this volcano from the side, you see a big umbrella of gas. Just the particles just come out and then they drop back down. Um, and I started studying volcanoes on Earth about 35 years ago and then started studying volcanoes on other planets and that grew into my love of our solar system. So the asteroid belt really contains a lot of leftover material from solar system formation. You can imagine that when the solar system first formed, the particles kind of came together and made bigger particles. Some of those came together and created the planets. We actually find asteroids in lots of different parts of our solar system. We have asteroids that are near Jupiter, the Lucy mission, which is going to launch this year in 2021. And it's gonna go study those special asteroids that are trapped in Jupiter's orbit. And then next year, we have another mission called Psyche that's going to a particular asteroid called Psyche. It looks to be made mostly of metal, of iron. It may actually be the exposed core of a small planet uh, that may have had its crust blown off by an impact and left that metal core that we can see. There is definitely water on the moon. We know this because we've observed with some of our orbiters uh, being able to identify that there's water molecules on the moon. And in fact, some of these we believe are preserved as water ice, perhaps in these permanently shadowed regions that are very, very cold near the poles. And what we need to do next is to actually go down to the surface of the moon and actually look at that ice up close and so that's what we're doing with the Artemis mission. We'll be focused on looking for some of that water in the soil of, of the moon. We have explored really the far reaches of our solar system. We have sent missions to Mercury near the sun and visited all of the planets in our solar system all the way out even to Pluto. And then one of our missions called Voyager actually has two spacecraft that have now even gone beyond the edges of our solar system. So we have really expanded the, explored the whole expanse of our solar system. Cool, Io and Mars are great. Let's try it again. Oh, that was too hot. <laughs> that was a fastball. She had a fastball.
Do you have a question for NASA? Send your questions to our experts using hashtag AskNASA. Welcome to NASA EDGE, an inside and outside look at all things NASA. We're joined by Michelle Monk and Steve Gaddis. How are you guys doing? Great. And we have a, a very important topic today, and that's going to be EDL, or Entry, Descent, and Landing. Now, Michelle, you're the principal technologist for EDL. Yes. What is Entry, Descent, and Landing? Entry, Descent, and Landing is how we get a spacecraft from the top of an atmosphere to a planetary surface. So the entry part refers to you know the atmospheric flight, most of it, and then we have descent and landing, which is usually propulsive and get us down on the surface safely. We do D and L um, at places that don't have atmospheres like the moon or you know asteroids, but usually we talk about EDL when we talk about atmospheres. So Michelle, what is your role as principal technologist for EDL? I look across all the missions that NASA has coming up that will use entry, descent, and landing on any planet and I look at the technologies we're gonna need for those missions, and I bring them forward to the mission directorate uh, for starting funding. So you have a, a need in the EDL world, in the community, you're, you're coming up with the technologies that are needed for, for future missions. Right. Uh, and so you take some of those technologies that maybe are less mature, hand them off to you, right. and then you mature those technologies. Design, develop, test, and evaluate. Is that, is that a pretty easy task, trying to figure out not at all. What technology are you going to need? <laughs> Not at all. I have to look at both the human missions that are coming up, so, you know, sending humans to Mars. Right. I have to look at the scientific missions that are coming up and all the destinations the scientists want to go to. And I have to kind of rank those and prioritize them and figure out, you know, where they are in terms of maturity and what the best infusion point will be. When is the first mission that can use that technology? And then I have to figure out what is the best program within STMD for the investment. Is it better to have a university work on it or a small business or is it better for a game-changing program element? And, and your job is really hard because we're going to be talking about a suite of EDL projects over the next two shows because there's so much content in EDL. We can't, we can't do this in the one show. Absolutely. So this will be part one of, uh, of two parts. So how do you manage all that? Well, uh, one is it's hard, but it's also fun. And we've got excellent technologists leading every one of these activities. So we all work together, and we all know that we need these technologies, so we're motivated to see them be successful. We're a very passionate community. Yes. Oh, I, I've seen that. And all, all the interviews that we've done, there's, you guys are definitely passionate. Now, the first one that we're going to be talking about is ESM, or Entry Systems Modeling. What is that about? So that's the first part of it, where they're, they're, they develop these models and simulations to understand how the technology works and how it will be beneficial at a system level. It's very cross-cutting against all the projects. And the plan is to take that data and then infuse it into the projects. You know, Blair had a chance to go out to NASA Ames Research Center to talk to Mike Barnhart, who is the integrated EDL systems lead. Let's check it out. Mike, tell me a little bit about Entry Systems Modeling Project. What is it? So the Entry Systems Modeling Project is tasked with developing a lot of these technologies that are coming from lower technology readiness level, things like academia, and trying to bring them up to a level so that we're ready to help them. So in this particular situation, we're talking about EDL projects, and so you're actually helping them raise their technology readiness level? That's right, so any of these things, you know, Orion, Mars 2020, Mars Insight, Anybody that's flying anywhere in the solar system and they need to enter an atmosphere, you have to go through an entry, descent, and landing phase. And we don't have all those problems solved. We don't have all those technologies built. And so we're continually trying to 
improve on our existing technologies and also renew with new ideas. And that's the real purpose of the Enter Systems Modeling Project. How do we get the data we need to improve the EDL process across these missions? Right, so there's a lot of different things that we can do. We have ground facilities, which we rely on a lot. So we have arc jets that we do for material characterization and developing models for material response. We have our shock tubes, which we use to develop radiation models. We have wind tunnels that we use to build aerodynamic models, the dynamic motion of a body as it's flying, that sort of thing. We need to know all that in order to have a successful entry into a planetary atmosphere. So that's the simplest thing that we have access to every day. And then we also have, you know, some amount of flight data. So there was the Orion EFT-1 flight last year, which was very successful, and we can use that to take our models and look at our predictions and then try and back out, you know, exactly how well are we doing, quantify, you know, how well are we predicting that. You used a lot of data from the Apollo era. Are you able to use data from things like MSL and more recent missions to help? Because I know we have limited data on entry. Yeah, so, you know, MSL is a really great example because we flew Medley on MSL and that allowed us to get some of the only data that we've had on entry at Mars. So heating data, pressure data, which we use to reconstruct the aerodynamics is fantastic tool for us, but there's a lot of challenges there as well. So it's really, you know, it takes a village. <laughs> you need to have your computational models because they're the only thing that's going to access the true flight space that we have here on the ground. We have ground facilities that simulate parts of the flight space. And then ultimately you have a little bit of flight data and your goal is ground to flight traceability. Let's predict what we do on the ground. Let's predict what we do in the air. And let's see, you know, how far apart are we so that we can quantify when we're designing the next mission exactly where we think we'll be. Are you sharing that data with all the different EDL potential systems that are being developed? To, to Absolutely. Absolutely. Everything that we do in the InterSystems Modeling Project is, you know, for the greater good. <laughs> it's, we work very closely with academia. So we've got university partners that we are sharing this data with to help improve our models. We share it with other projects. So with radiation modeling, we were working very closely with the InSight project and OSIRIS-REx projects because they had issues with radiative heating on their back shell. So they call us because we're the radiation modeling experts and they say, here's our problem. Tell us, you know, how, how worried do we need to be? Okay. Be yeah, worried, we're, we're be very always, worried. <laughs> yeah, we're always looking to help everyone else around the age. And that's really what Space Technology Mission Director is all about, right? Is trying to help the other directorates with the technology that they're gonna need. Tell you what, great interview with Mike Barnhart. I mean, it really kind of gives you the flavor of how difficult EDL really is. Right. I mean, if you can't characterize it and, and model it here on, on the ground, yeah. I mean, you'll, you'll never be able to land. That's right. And you can't test an entry system on the ground and get the flight-like data that you need to design. And, th <laughs> and, and, and that's the challenge because, but with Medley, on MSL, that was a game changer, wasn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you actually, for the first time, were, were able to actually see the health of the spacecraft as it was entering the atmosphere. Yeah. Right. As engineers, you know, it's great that we succeeded, but I want to know if I got an A plus or a C minus right. on the design. So <laughs> the Medley data allowed us to actually know how we designed the vehicle. And, and based on that Medley data, what, what were the results? They were pretty good, weren't they? They oh, were excellent. fantastic. But we found some things that we didn't know. Radiative heating is important at Mars and at, at the scale of MSL. We didn't recognize that before. And now, since it was, it was such an important mission for you guys, now you're going to take it to the next level for Medley 2 Medley for Mars two. 2020. For Mars 2020, yeah. We've got that going, and they're right in the middle of their preliminary design phase. Right. Um, they're all excited. They're going to put some new measurements on the back shell. Yeah, they were actually at Aberdeen Proving Ground last week doing some testing to see where to put the pressure measurement on the back of the vehicle. Right. So yeah, it's really exciting to get this new data in the back shell and using new sensors. We well, you know uh, Blair had a chance to sit down with Mark Schoenenberger, uh, who's the reconstruction lead, which well, i got to ask you about that when we come back, because i never heard of a reconstruction lead. But we're going to learn more about Melly too. Let's check it out. So Mark, when we think about the differences between Medley 1 and Medley 2, it's interesting because Medley 1, the M stood for 
uh, MSL, Mars Science Laboratory. Now it's Mars 2020. You guys caught a break. You get to use the same letter. <laughs> we still get to use the same letter. I think it'll just be shortened to Mars. EDL instrumentation, and it'll hopefully continue um, for a bunch more medleys, medley three, four. We can always call it Mars. Uh, um, perfect. <laughs> it's a nice little series you got going. It's, yep, and These, we're get, yep, we're getting great data. So. Now, I'm wondering, though, in terms of technology and in terms of how you're growing medley, I mean, medley one was a very successful mission as far as the data we got back. Mm -hmm. What are we expecting for Medley 2? For Medley 2, uh, it's really to dig in and look at the pieces that we couldn't quite get for um, Medley 1. Um, the instrumentation there was to really, it was the first time we'd flown instrumentation since Viking to get pressure and heating data. So we really tried to capture the whole event. And to do that, especially for pressures, we had these transducers that could see the peak high pressure as you went through the hypersonic phase and you're really slowing down around Mach 18. And then as you slow down, you really start getting in the noise there with the kind of information you can get. The signal is just really weak. It's sort of like using your bathroom scale to measure the ingredients for a cake. It's mm -hmm. just, you know, it's, there's not a lot of resolution there. So you, it's tough. You, you don't really trust those measurements. That's about how my cakes turn that's, out that's as right. if I measured ingredients. Yeah. With the... So what we did here now is to use more of a postal scale uh, for pressure. So we're, we're measuring down at the low range when we're flying supersonically. Right as we get near parachute deploy, we're spending a lot of time just kind of slowing down, flying at the same altitude. But you're really at terminal velocity. You're not slowing down real well. Now, um, is, is that pretty much in the part of the descent, if you will, that where, where you've burned away most of the heat shield that you're going to in the process? Yeah, all the heating's over. Um, I mean, it's still a little warm, and things are kind of winding down. But yeah, all the exciting heating stuff is over, and you're really just trying to bleed off energy until you get down to a condition that's safe for the parachute. And so any error in your prediction of how that vehicle slows down or your prediction of what the atmosphere is gonna end up being uh, on the day at Mars um, can lead to being far uprange or far downrange. You know, your, your landing ellipse and how you target it, you need to account for that. So if we can get better data to characterize the aerodynamics, we can tighten that up and land in even smaller spaces. Which is always the goal, right?